if I sound weird, weirder than normal, it's because I have a cold while I'm filming. On September 29th, 2013, the Breaking Bad finale, Felina, aired. Yes, the finale of Breaking Bad is nearly 10 years old. I was at the beginning of my masters when I watched the finale. Time is a monster and it will devour us all. Help us all. In the culmination of one of the most beloved series of all time of my generation, if not yours, Walter White breaks his witness protection for Bad Boys program after being an idiot and outing himself as a drug kingpin to return to New Mexico after about a year. And he does a lot of things here. He gets revenge on his former Grey Matters partners, even though I still have no idea what the hell they actually did. He poisons a duplicitous drug dealer. He tells Skylar where Hank's body is. And he finally admits to something that everyone with a brain figured out. One more time that you did this for the family. I did it for me. Trust me, if you weren't around for the Breaking Bad discourse at the time, you have no idea how satisfying it was to hear him say in his own words that this had nothing to do with all his family. We get a shootout with the Nazi guys who kidnapped Jesse. We get Todd. Hooray! Question mark? Strangled. And I swear to God, I had to put my mouth into my arm to stop myself from screaming loud because I'm watching this at like first thing in the morning just before I go to college and it is the most satisfying thing I have ever seen. God, Jesse Plemons is an amazing actor because I despised Todd. We get a wordless goodbye from Walt and Jesse, the former screaming in joy as he goes to freedom. The latter of which ironically gets shot by his own Gatling gun robot and dies in his meth lab as the police circle in on him. At the time, Felina was considered the a perfect finale for this show and one of the best series finales that's ever been made. But was it? This was even something that was mused shortly after it aired, as Alan Sippenwell wrote in his review. Felina doesn't feel like a cheat or a massive misstep or an overreach. This is one of the greatest shows of my lifetime, and nothing in this concluding chapter changes that. But it also felt so neat and so orderly in such an unbreaking bad sort of way that I don't think I can give the show bonus points for its last episode in the same way that The Shield or Six Feet Under get extra credit for their finales. Most of this last half season was astonishing, but I don't think Gilligan was being self-effacing when he said Ozymandias was the best episode they ever made. That was essentially where the story of Walter White ended. These last two weeks have been an extended epilogue. Given everything that Walt had been through and put us through over these 62 episodes, I think I might have preferred the whole package be wrapped in a bow that wasn't so... tight. It's a more cathartic, upbeat conclusion than if the series had ended with Walt getting into Robert Forster's van or living alone in the snowy cabin. But is it ultimately a more fitting one for this series? As time has gone on, I feel the same way about Felina as the sheen has kind of gone off the surface. While it's not unprecedented that a show this popular would get spin-offs, we have stuff like the epilogue movie Il Camino and the mostly prequel series Better Call Saul, which seems to reflect a lot on this finale. Like, there's something more satisfying to get after Too Perfect. And I kind of got a similar feeling when I watched the prequel film for Sopranos, The Merry Saints of Newark. And I like that finale a lot. I actually like it a lot more than Breaking Bad. But it's definitely more of a kind of intellectual kind of fulfillment rather than an emotional one. And if you know anything about the backlash to it, you can understand that it wasn't as effective for many people who watched it at the time. Endings are hard, and this is especially the case for television because a lot of times you don't actually know when your show is going to end. It, it, it just either you have a satisfying conclusion or more than likely the network just cans it after it doesn't make enough ratings for them. Or various other factors that can go into that. We're just going to pretend that the mic wasn't right in front of my face for the most of the first part of this video. It'll be our little secret. So keeping that in mind, what is an ending for a show that manages to be satisfying, gives us that emotional and intellectual catharsis, and yet doesn't tie everything up in a such a neat little bow? Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is a musical comedy series that ran from 2015 until 2019. It was created by Devil Wears Prada, and we bought a zoo scribe, Aline Brosh McKenna, and YouTube comedian Rachel Bloom. McKenna had actually watched Bloom's comedy sketches on YouTube, and decided they were, in fact, hilarious. And to her credit, she was right. I say I'm dying. He says I'm sorry. I say let's fuck. He says I'm sad now.
So what's it about? Well, Rebecca Bunch was working hard in a New York job making dough while she was feeling blue. One day she was crying a lot and then decided to move to West Covina, California. Brand new pals, a new career. How does it be where- Okay, I'm going to stop this bit. Mostly because I'm basically just stealing a joke from the show. Okay, just stop talking for a second. She's so broken inside. The situation is a lot more nuanced than that. But yes, the show is about Rachel Bloom, who, after a chance encounter with Josh Chan, a boy she dated in high school, which was like, I think during the 30s at this point, so it was like nearly like a decade and a half ago, decides out of nowhere to leave her high power job in New York to move to his hometown, which he's moving back to, in West Covina, in California. She moves under the guise that she's looking for something new and fulfilling in her life, but in actuality, she's chasing after Josh after a chance encounter with him, and because they dated, like, over a decade ago. I should also mention, the show is a musical. Every episode has at least one or two songs, and they all slap. Like my pussy, you two have wonderful taste. Most of them slap. There's some, I mean, they have to write a song in every episode. It's actually, the, the hit to miss ratio is pretty damn good for four seasons of this. If any of this sounds interesting to you, I would recommend stopping this video now and watching it if you haven't already. Because I'm talking about the finale if you, you partially guessed, and I will be spoiling the entire thing. It's better to go in having completely finished the show, and it's only four seasons, it's... Not, it's not that huge a time commitment and it's really fucking good so. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is what I'd call in the vein of a self-aware comedy. It's the same as Arrested Development and Community. Arrested Development dealt with this by subverting sitcom tropes at the time. We had a strict continuity, running gags that could go on for episodes, even years, and it usually subverts the usual kind of wholesome and finite ways that shows wrapped up at the time. Community dealt more with dissecting tropes and cliches of sitcoms, as well as other stuff in TV and film. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, by contrast, dealt with character roles. Rebecca Bunch starts off as your typical starry-eyed romantic heroine type who gets into wacky situations all for the name of love, as you've probably seen a million times in many shows of this form. However, the show is very aware that her actions have consequences. Clip. What will you learn? What will you learn? That your actions have consequences! It points out that if these hijinks were held to a social standard, Rebecca would do a lot of damage both to the people around her and especially herself. And in particular, it calls out the reason why she moves here because it really makes her look like, well, a crazy ex-girlfriend. That's a sexist term. We end up examining our lead in a way that most comedies wouldn't dare touch. And because of that, this show is very praised for its mental health depiction. I'll get back to that. But first, let's go into setting up for the finale. And our main topic going into it is, who will Rebecca end up with? a topic that has been examined by the show for basically its entire run. We have the incredibly dopey and himbo redefined Josh, who was the impetus for the show to begin with. I, I recently made a big decision. Are you finally moving out of Hector's mom's house? No, she's awesome. We have Greg, Josh's cynical best friend, who meets Rebecca in the pilot, and they very quickly form a bond. I'm actually here because I'm meeting a friend, but I don't, I don't see him. Great, maybe I know him. Is he eight years old? Or an alcoholic? Because that's what we've got here. And then we have Nathaniel, Rebecca's boss, who's introduced in late season two. Nathaniel represents everything that she was running away from in New York, and eventually he becomes a better person because of her influence. Strip away my conscience. What? We set this up into an penultimate episode where all three of them going on amazing dates, including nearly getting a balloon ride, from Weird Al Yankovic. This is a thread that's been kind of ramping up in the final season, including reintroducing Greg with a new actor, as he had been off the show since early season two. And I must say, the show completely got me because I was not really knowing who the love of Rebecca's life is. And to be clear, it's not Josh, it's not Greg, and it's not Nathaniel. It's Paula. And I mean, think about it. She's the first person to see through Rebecca's bullshit at the beginning of the show and starts helping her with her schemes to try to get Josh. During her eternal boyfriend quest, we see her spend way more time with Paula than any of her love interests. Them falling out is a huge, huge subplot in season two and it allows the show to be more communal and involve the rest of the cast than just those whose shenanigans. Season two and three ends with stingers involving P Rebecca and Paula, where Paula is you know, scheming for revenge against Josh at the end of season two 
and is the impetus for Rebecca pleading guilty to manslaughter at the end of season three. Like I said, I'm not explaining any of this. If you haven't watched the show, this is your own fault. Now, as Paula becomes a more selfless person and becomes more career oriented and her goals become more defined, she becomes way less involved and interested in this other woman's shenanigans, Rebecca in turn becomes more grounded and is a lot more unwilling to do these dumb gestures and schemes, especially as her mental health becomes a lot better. They complement each other's growth. I could go on, but I think we should talk a bit more about Rebecca's BBD diagnosis. Scene change, yay. Now, I don't have borderline personality disorder, but I know people who do. One of the common traits that's brought up about it is the lack of ability to maintain steady relationships, in particular friendships. You meet someone feel an affinity while it's shiny and new and it feels great like a new car then it slowly wears down more and more of your flaws slip through your weird statements and actions make little nicks and dents in the relationship one at a time with the perfect veneer of the paint gone oxygen can get in leading to the cancer of rust Eventually, either the person quietly trades you in for a new model, or the car just falls apart spectacularly while you're both still in it. One of the clearest ways to spot someone with BPD is the lack of long-term relationships and jobs, but that's another post. The cycle feeds on itself because the more people drift away because of your weird emotions and behavior, the weirder your emotions and behavior become in the presence of people you like and are afraid to lose. Reading this is actually really close to how Rebecca and Paula fall out in season two. In particular, as they both kind of branch out and meet new friends. Rebecca actually forms this little friend group of previous characters that come in and gain more prominence here. But here's the thing, they don't leave each other. In fact, most of Rebecca's relationships that she makes in West Covina remain relatively stable and healthy. Most mental illnesses, not just BPD, push you to a place where you become isolated. Like you don't advance as well as those around you and it becomes difficult to find the energy to maintain relationships. Adult relationships in particular can be very draining. And Rebecca didn't have much of a fighting chance to begin with. We see that her mother competed her against girls her own age. And I think this is implied why she doesn't seem to have a lot of friends or really any friends before she moves. She tended to view female relationships either competitively or something she could take advantage of. And Paula is the first friend she makes when she moves. Now, this is a relationship that seems to be way codependent to begin with. And it's more circumstantial because Paula figures out very quickly on why she's here. But it grows into something more compassionate, nurturing, and for probably the first time in Rebecca's life, real. And this expands out to the entire cast. I sometimes think of the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, can also be applied to people with mental illnesses, especially with something as complex as BPD. You need people to parse out and rely on and not be utterly dependent on what is called the favorite person. And we see that. The friend group that Rebecca makes in season two, the one that seems to come together initially very superficially, we see them at the end of the show with Paula fully ingratiated into them, supporting Rebecca in her passion. They love each other and they want what's best for each other. Speaking of passion, this show is a musical and it's mostly told from Rebecca's perspective. So all the songs are coming from her point of view, right? Well, not really, as we see a lot of songs that she couldn't have possibly been there to witness them happening. She also has a rather passionate encyclopedic knowledge of musicals. I could list all the references here, but we'd be here all day. Also, you know them. I know you know them because you did watch the show and listen to me, right? Right? But oh man, that's self-doubt, even in stuff that you really love and really means something to you. And we see that with Rebecca because at the beginning of season four, we find out that in real life, she actually doesn't have a strong a voice. And I think that self-doubt really hits hard with BPD in particular. It can really make you depersonalize and even with that, the social stigma around it and the anxiety that can cause can really hurt your self-esteem in a lot of ways. Again, I don't have BPD, but I can certainly relate to that. But you know what really helps? Someone that sees you for you, your best and your worst, and says that they see someone amazing. I'm wary of turning this into a summary the video, but to contextualize my point here, I'm going to have to go over the finale. So very brief overview for fun. So it's on Valentine's Day, and one of the first scenes we get is Rebecca talking to her long-suffering therapist, Dr. Copian. 
Except it's not. It's a dream, which is a cute reference to season one. And we see her um, imagining what her life would be like if she chooses either Josh, Greg, or Nathaniel. And she's miserable in all of them. Intercut throughout the episode is a flash forward where we see Rebecca getting ready to do something based on the decision she made a year prior. We see Paula call to her and get her ready as she's anxious about whatever this event is. And yes, Paula's the first person we see her interact with in this episode, which I think is pointed. Also, again, this doesn't have much to do with my video here, but the B-plot is focused mainly on Paula, and I think that's important because she's the one who gets the focus of this final episode alongside Rebecca. So in the main meat of the episode, we see the two discuss their issues. We even have this little point that Paula makes that Rebecca doesn't try to turn the conversation immediately into her own issues, which is cute and really shows her growth. Here we get the final full number, 11 o'clock, which is a medley of a lot of the popular songs from the show. We also see Paula acknowledge that Rebecca kind of disassociates when these musicals starts and she just kind of drifts off into space while they're happening. Paula here confronts Rebecca and what that happens when she does this and we get to a moment that could have entirely broken the show if not handled well. Rebecca tells Paula she fantasizes about musical numbers to deal with problems in her life and then takes her to this mental space. Like, it's literally the stage where she just had her final number. This is it's a magical realism that never, ever happens on the show. And yet, it makes perfect sense for Rebecca to kind of compartmentalize her issues through use of musical theater, especially with everything we know about her. And it's not Josh, Nathaniel, or Greg who she trusts to let into this space. It's Paula, who doesn't laugh at her, who doesn't tell her she's being ridiculous, who doesn't freak out that this woman has broken all laws of reality by bringing her into this abstract space. She tells her this is the solution, that this is her mind telling her what she is missing in her life. And this right here is where we get the final piece of singing in the show. It's a reprise of Wes Covina where Paula sings to Rebecca that you're remarkable. This scene represents joy for me because I'm roughly Rebecca's age. I don't know how much I want to get into my personal life on this channel. I've mentioned bits and pieces here and there, but nothing too kind of heavy. But one of the things I will say is that I've always wanted to do YouTube videos. I've been wanting to do them for years, and I only really found a place to do them, especially in this capacity as kind of video essays, like around lockdown. And man, it's a struggle to feel motivated to do any of this. And you could see by my very erratic schedule, I also work full time, so that doesn't really help. But one of the big things is like finding motivation to do this and think that anyone, like having the gall to think that anyone would want to watch this shit and like that people would make fun of me or mock me or tell me that like I'm, you know, I'm not worthy bringing all my thoughts to this stage and me just kind of shutting down and moving away. Like the internet can be scary. And this is a hobby for me. I do not plan to ever make a living out of doing this. So I can relate to Rebecca's headspace of doing something she thought was right and for money for years and letting go of the anxiety and the shame and the ability to think that you are not good enough to do what you want to love doing and just throwing herself out there and like she leaves her job to follow this kind of passion that her mom set on and it's mentioned a lot she's a really good lawyer so like she's giving up a great career that she's actually really good at to find this sense of contentment what makes her happy and we see it as she shines in these final moments is making music. And I love it because, yeah, I wasn't expecting this is where the show is going to go in the finale. That this isn't the standard kind of sitcom thing where we find out which guy she ends up getting with. But this isn't the standard sitcom. I mean, this did start because she decided to stalk a man by uprooting her life and following him. It's weird that Josh is one of the options here. I think it's telling that he's the only one who seems to be, like, in a committed relationship. Not that that can't fall apart, but I think the writers are trying to make clear that, like, there is no chance for the two of them moving forward. Nathaniel gets to work at a zoo, again callback, and he starts crying and it's the sweetest moment in the entire series. And Greg is really happy keeping up his sobriety and working at a restaurant. As Rebecca said, he's ahead of her. Rebecca gives this lovely speech, showing her entire community what she has been chasing her entire life with this want for connection has been inside her all along. Because she's not perfect, she's self-centered and obsessive and makes these ridiculous leaps of logic that gets herself and others around her in trouble. But she's also sincerely compassionate, loving, and well, creative. And she didn't realize that until the love of her life showed her. Who is Paula, if you didn't gather that, who also gets the final reaction shot before Rebecca goes to play her song. 
And that's what I love about this. It doesn't try to go for some shallow intellectual treaties or, you know, try to sum up everything in this neat little book. We don't know who Rebecca will end up with, if anyone. We don't know where this new venture of hers will go. Hell, we don't even hear her first song out of her head. And yet the show helps us realize what she needs. A decent community around her, a skill set she wasn't really aware of, or us, but it's been hinted at throughout the show and comes to this natural really well-defined conclusion by the end. And yes, a friend who sees her literal inner self and tells her she's remarkable. I love this show, and I love that it tells you that no matter your struggles, either mentally or socially, you could strive to be better and do better, and you deserve better. So, here's to a perfectly imperfect finale for all the perfectly imperfect people out there. This is a song I wrote watching uh this was part well this was inspired by a um one scene for joy that was uh started by uh, sarah the fat culture critic i'll leave a link to her uh youtube below this is kind of what it started off and it just kind of ventured off into other things talking about mental health and uh the idea of tv show finales is just really interesting to me like how you end something that in theory should run indefinitely until you know, it does because like very rarely do shows like end on their own terms breaking bad is an example of one that actually does you know, end on its own terms. Made it a really good example of start at the beginning of this. I just wanted to thank Mike and Divergent Dissident for offering their voices. Divergent Dissident is a YouTuber in her own right. I will link her YouTube down uh, below. Yeah, this one, again, was difficult because it's a lot more personal than I usually get on this channel. I'm way more kind of just analyzing media and stuff. And actually, the last time I did it was for another one of Sarah's lists that I got a bit more personal, which is the one scene for Hope. Um, which um, I think I'll link that too because I'm really proud of that. I did run the stuff about Borderline through some uh, friends of mine, um, but obviously I'm not an expert on it. It's a very complicated and unfortunately very stigmatized uh, personality disorder, uh, disability. Um, so if you have any um, criti criticisms towards how I depicted it, I would happily listen to it. Please leave a comment. Um, I'm always open to uh being shown i'm wrong i'm obviously open to learning something that's you know very personal to people and you know has a very profound effect on their lives so i'll work away um one thing i will say is that i don't think i made it clear that like when i call paul as rebecca soulmate it, it sounds like i'm saying like she's they're in love which is it's not no i don't think that like they have a romantic interest with each other at all like there's clearly a more maternal bond from Paul and Rebecca. It's it's way more of that kind of friendship. But I do think, you know, that friendships can be soulmates. And I mean, uh, we should learn from the great scholar Bill Nighy in Love Actually. So um, and just in case people got the wrong idea from how I presented that, I just thought I'd correct it briefly. But as always, leave a like, leave a comment. Uh, roast me alive in the terrible ways I do. Does any engagement is good? Because that's all we do things for, to engage internally and get that hit of dopamine. Yay. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, see you on the flip side.